Before I, uh, if I start the introduction, I'll forget to say this, so I'm saying about lunch first. Um, if you are unfamiliar with this area, there are sheets outside at the tables um, with suggestions uh, for a variety of um, price range, restaurants in a variety of price ranges, and please pick them up. We'll reconvene here at 2 o'clock for the afternoon panel. And um, at, I have the pleasure now of introducing Walter Walsh. Um, well, you have you have it, the full version in the in the program, but um, Walter is associate professor of law at the University of Washington, Seattle, and he's been on the law school faculty there since 1998. He had been um, a Golub, Golub fellow um, in legal history here at NYU School of Law. He's visiting professor at the Central European University Budapest, and also um, at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, He's a variety of interests. Um, he, he is also the biographer of William Sampson, his um, doctoral dissertation at Yale, right? At Harvard. Harvard, I'm sorry. At Harvard was on William Sampson, and, um, which is the subject of his talk today. He will, you know, we've done a lot of talking about the trial so far, People v. Phillips and the context of it, and yet for some of you here, you won't know just who this man is and why he bothered to take on this trial. Walter and I go back at least 20 years. Um, we met when we were in graduate school, and um, we have shared the presidency of the New York Irish History Roundtable. I think you succeeded me. Did you? After? Um, I don't know. If I, I don't know. I don't know the order, but well, we come. Either I came before him, or he came before me. I, well, anyway, um, and at that time, 20 years ago, we um, started to dream up something like, which is evolving right this minute, and it's, it's incredible to be here and have the privilege of introducing Walter. Um, one of the things we did back in those days was restore the gravestone of Matilda Tone, Theobald Wolf Tone's widow, who is buried in Greenwood Cemetery, where we are all going tomorrow, those of you who are welcome to come. Um, and there is a coach leaving from Ireland House at noon, First come, first serve for seating on it. If you wish to go on the coach to Greenwood, um, there's a sign-up sheet also at the back. But I remember from that, that um, wonderful program we did in Greenwood Cemetery, um, you know, in the lead-up to it, Walter pointed out that William Sampson is buried in the same plot as Matilda Tone. And th the big, tall, six-foot um, brownstone headstone was lying flat and so Walter lay down on William Sampson's grave. He stretched out on the grave and, you know, dreamed this weekend. So here we are, okay. Um, he also, in the course of his research, tracked down Sampson's relatives and um, had access to um, a private collection of Sampson's letters, which inform a lot of his work as well. So, uh, and Walter has, um, we've invited him, uh, he's, been a speaker at Ireland House in the past. He was our O'Malley lecturer a few years ago in which he talked about another uh, trial that Samson argued, which was the 1824 Orange Green Riot trial here in Greenwich Village, which is published in um, the Ireland House's journal. It was called Ryark at that time. So you, it's available. If anybody you want to know more about William Samson, that's not People v. Phillips. You can look at, at that. Okay, so without further ado, um, please welcome Walter Walsh. Good uh, morning, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I have been asked to speak on how William Sampson, uh, who was born in 1764, came to be amicus curiae in People versus Phillips in the context of his interests in radical politics and human rights law. And so my answer to that is uh, coming from um, uh, really the same course that I'm teaching uh, at the University of Washington. I call that Rights, Revolutions, Republics, 1750 to 1850, the work and works of William Sampson. 
uh, the date 1750 to 1850, when you think about it, there's something extraordinary, which I have to admit I only recently recognized, which is that Samson's life is exactly bisected by the year 1800. He lived for 36 years prior to uh, 1800 in the, in the 18th century, and then for 36 years uh, in the 19th century. He died in 1836. And uh, as it happens, his life can be divided into hexennials, six-year periods. Um, and they tend to fall on very uh, epochal moments, I would say. Um, but when you think about it then, so he was, if, if you take the, the year 1750, for example, just a few years, 14 years before his birth, um, that is a completely different world. The Ancien Regime that he lived in uh, was born into with the penal laws of Ireland in place uh, than the world that he died in, because again, 14 years after his death was the year 1850, industrialized America. So his life, in so many ways, uh, really embodies this extraordinary century where we shift from revolution into the post-colonial modern world that we live in today. So in 1750, uh, as you have seen by law in Ireland, the Catholic Gaelic-speaking majority in Ireland, they cannot vote, sit in parliament, own land, attend university, hold government office, serve in juries, practice law, and so forth. Um, from exile, Samson is keenly aware of how far his distant ideals have led him from the easy future that once beckoned. He had spurned his natural place in the small but dominant Protestant ascendancy, an oligarchy maintained by a rigid system of political, economic, and religious repression of the impoverished Catholic masses. Samson knew well that my interest, my connections, and my hopes lay decidedly with the court party rather than the people, but he nevertheless viewed resistance against that establishment as the only moral course of action. Being of the favored caste and far from having any personal griefs, the road to advancement on the contrary very open to me. I could have no motion but, motive but that of compassion for my country. I never was inclined to political contention and it required strong conviction to move me to sedition. But there are moments when to be passive is to be criminal, as when we see a murder committed before our eyes and do not stretch our hand. The griefs of Irish men are undeniable, but when torture and every other enormity was superadded to those wrongs, the voice of a nation and the laws of God set openly at defiance, I asked myself by what tie I was bound to submit, for I had not sworn allegiance to the Prince of Darkness. Samson's connections, intimacies, youthful habits, and ties of blood lay on the one side, while the voice of reason and humanity and the instinctive horror of oppression and cruelty called him to the other. How many ties, he asked, must then be rent asunder? William Samson's odyssey began in the city of Derry on January the 17th, 1764. William was the youngest of five children born to the Reverend Arthur Samson, an Anglican minister, and his wife, Mary Spate, William's brother George traced the family's history back to Richard, son of the Bishop of Lichfield in Coventry, who came to Ireland during the reign of Elizabeth, bringing with him 100 halberdiers to support the authority of Her Majesty and his own possessions. For the next three generations, Richard's descendants held the rank of colonel in the British Army, and for three generations after that were beneficed clergymen of the established church. George followed his father into the rectory, and one of William's two sisters married another Anglican minister. With these traditions, support of the Protestant establishment must surely have seemed Samson's destiny. But perhaps ominously, Samson's mother was related to Richard Dobbs Spate, signer of the U.S. Constitution. In Samson's words, Catholics were to be thrown on the mercy of their persecutors. Reflecting upon the Irish laws in 1813 and the Phillips case that existed as he was uh, growing up, Samson observed that the tormentor sought out every tender part where the moral being could be afflicted and cruelly conveyed the maddening poison through every organ of most exquisite sensibility, insulting religion, reversing the principles of law, violating parental affection, private friendship, filial duty, conjugal love, 
promoting family dissension, preventing education, proscribing industry, and having done all this, setting a bar against all future acquisitions of wealth, influence, or knowledge. In short, leaving nothing that hell could invent unattempted in order to brutalize and enfeeble a race of beings whose courage and intellect was still form formidable, even in this abject state. Samson noted the formidable ideological capacity of the Irish penal laws to obscure authentic moral and legal norms, especially in a colonial common law system. It appears throughout this code, he pointed out, that all principles of law are reversed and go by contraries, and that what is law for Protestants is not for Catholics, and vice versa. It is not therefore wonderful that those familiarized to it by education and habit should judge in the same perverse sense, even where there was no statute precisely oversetting the principles of the law. From when he was three or four years old, Samson was raised in a Spartan manner by a maiden aunt. In the words of his daughter Catherine, she brought him up hardily, having the ice broken in winter to plunge him into the cold water beneath. Her plan succeeded and he grew strong and healthy. In 1776, when Samson was a boy of just 12 years old, as he later described it, the American Revolution reduced the theories of the great philosophers of England, France, and other countries into practice, and persecutors began to find themselves surprised, like owls overtaken by the day. Even in Ireland, Samson wrote, the cheering ray pierced the gloomy night of oppression. It awaked the sleeping genius of a reanimated people and raised up those champions of civil and religious rights within and without the walls of parliament, whose splendid eloquence showed the native measure of many a thousand souls that bondage had degraded. Already as a youth, Samson's adventurous spirit drew him far from familiar surroundings. While on one expedition to barren Tory Island off the coast of Donegal, the young Samson was caught alone in a boat during rough seas. After a night or two, he fell senseless, but was luckily cast ashore. When he revived, he was stretched on a bed in a cabin and surrounded by women lamenting over him with great eloquence of speech and gesture. He remained here for some days, treated by the poor and ignorant inhabitants with great kindness. Samson's solitary journey to that bleak and lonely western island on that occasion suggests that it was probably not his first visit. And this incident shed some light on his unusual appreciation of the culture and language of the Catholic peasantry and his sympathy for the hardships they endured. Samson stood in sharp contrast to the radical Protestant intellectuals with whom he later associated, most of whom were far more conversant with classical antiquity, British constitutional history, and French revolutionary theory than with the ancient Gaelic culture of their own country. Much later, in exile, Samson spoke a few words in Gaelic to an American jury, and he frequently reflected upon the rich native cultural heritage which at that time went unseen by the English-speaking aristocracy. William Samson's first direct exposure to nationalist politics came at the age of 18, when he held a commission in the Irish Volunteers. Not sure what age he is in this picture. It's a different one from the one we've seen before, but it may not be too far off that. He held a commission in the Irish Volunteers. He was related through his mother to Colonel Sherman, one of their leaders. Originally formed as a loyal defense against foreign aggression, the Volunteers were by 1782 tentatively demanding concessions from the government. Samson was more impressed by their honorable offers of conciliation to their Catholic brethren than by their resistance to England, for that was not much. But their modest nationalism did exert considerable pressure on the British government at a time when its authority had so recently been successfully challenged by the Americans. Indeed, in the very year that Samson joined, the volunteers passed the Dungannon resolutions demanding Irish legislative autonomy and other reforms. And within months, British legislative supremacy had seemingly been relinquished and the destiny of Ireland entrusted to an exclusively Protestant Irish parliament. Before that decade's close, the stirring scenes of the French Revolution unleashed a nationalism much more potent, much more impatient, and much more furious than that of the Irish volunteers. To idealists, the fall of the Bastille in July 1789 marked the collapse of tyranny, privilege, and corruption, and the replacement by a glittering new structure built on the equality, liberty, and fraternity of all citizens. In stark contrast, conservatives saw all social order being washed away in a river of blood. 
Samson joined forces in Ireland with Catholics, Protestants, and Presbyterians who sought universal suffrage and the extension of the franchise and equal rights to the Catholic masses. The group who banded, this group who banded together as the aptly named United Irish Men eventually called for a republic in Ireland and the end of colonial tyranny. The United Irishmen would lead the famous 1798 uprising in Ireland, an early indigenous political quest for a free Irish republic. Samson was called to the Irish bar in the winter of 1792 after his training at Lincoln's Inn in London. He took lodgings in Dublin during terms at 43 Abbey Street, the broadest part, two or three rooms with use of the kitchen at a guinea and a half per week. And he spent his vacations in Belfast, where his residence with Grace and their two surviving children, two died in infancy, was in Arthur Street. In both cities, he mixed business and politics, being drawn over the next couple of years into the widening circle of intellectuals, all much influenced by the ideas of Tom Paine, who were profoundly disaffected with with the Irish political system. Samson's recognition of the role of class conflict in the judicial system began during his defense of sedition trials in the turbulent le years leading up to the Irish Rebellion of 1798. Himself a child of the ascendancy in Ireland's deeply fractured 18th century society, Samson recalled that the Catholics, now ground into dust, deprived of education and property and every means of acquiring either, became null in their native country. They had no part in the framing or execution of the laws being excluded from the parliament and the bench and from juries and from the bar. Their only duty was to bear with patience the penalties inflicted upon them and be spectators of the ludicrous though interested quarrels of their oppressors. When any question under the penal laws was tried against them, it was by a Protestant judge, a Protestant jury, and as they had a Protestant prosecutor, so they must have a Protestant advocate. What justice they could look for, heaven knows, they were shut out from all corporations and offices and every privilege belonging to freemen. In short, they were humbled below the beasts of the field. During this time, the poor Gaelic-speaking Catholic peasant who was becoming increasingly restive. Among Samson's radical associates were William Drennan, Theobald Wolfstone, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, Arthur O'Connor, Thomas Addis Emmett, William James McNevin, Samuel Nielsen, Archibald Hamilton Rowan, and Thomas Russell. Within a decade, all but Drennan would be either executed or banished for the revolutionary activity. The French Revolution had given a heady philosophical content to an ideal of self-determination that the Americans had already proven attainable. Archibald Hamilton Rowan, William Drennan, and the publishers of the strongly democratic Northern Star newspaper were successively prosecuted in a series of seditious libel trials from 1794 after publishing and distributing the Irish Jacobins' democratic resolutions. According to the Attorney General Arthur Wolfe, the United Irish principle of universal uh, emancipation and representative legislature would bury the Constitution in the anarchy of Republican power formed from the dregs of the people. This was challenged by defense counsel John Philpot Curran, the leading Irish advocate of his day, and although never a member, a staunch courtroom defender of the United Irishmen. Karl Marx later judged the period of the United Irishmen to be of the highest interest scientifically and dramatically. Marx was among many who were considerably impressed by Curran's speeches for the United Irish Legal Defense Team, which were all recorded by Samson. I consider Curran the only great lawyer, people's advocate of the 18th century, and the noblest personality, wrote Marx, while Henry Grattan was a parliamentary rogue. Samson was not a member of Rowan's defense team, being, as he later observed, too junior to take an active part in such a trial. He nevertheless sat beside his mentor, Curran, in the courtroom and took a shorthand note of the proceedings. Later, from his cell in Newgate Prison, Rowan collected Samson's notes of the trial, uh, with those of R William Ridgway, edited the result and published it. This was an event of some significance, the first step towards Samson's emergence as one of the earliest publishers of reliable and authentic trial reports, including every detail from the indictment through the witness examinations and cross-examinations, the testimony word for word, to the rulings of the bench and the final verdict. For Samson, this was a political enterprise which was inseparable from his jurisprudential writings, exposing the inherently political and thus questionable nature of legal authority. Reflecting on the beginnings of his work as a court reporter, Samson later wrote of Rowan's trial, I was then too young in my profession to take part in a trial where the most eminent lawyers were engaged on the same side. I therefore undertook that duty by which I could best serve 
that of writing down what passed to prevent others from imposing false statements upon the public. Incidentally, these Irish trial reports he published, with one exception, anonymously, because even though true, there was the fear of his own prosecution for seditious libel. Lord Clonmel, the Chief Justice, was furious when he saw the report of Rowan's trial advertised. He challenged the printer, Patrick Byrne, another United Irishman, take care, sir, what you do. I give you this caution. For if there are any reflections on the judges of the land, by the eternal God, I will lay you by the heels. Byrne coolly thanked his lordship for the caution, adding, I have many opportunities of going to Newgate, but I've never been ambitious of that honor. Clonmel repeated his threat, claiming that one of Rowan's advocates had misrepresented him in an inflammatory speech and warning Byrne that if you print or publish what may inflame the mob, it behooves the judges of the land to notice it. In 1794, in the same year, Samson began publishing his radical satirical pamphlets. He produced two scathing satires which pungently expressed his disillusionment with the legal system. These uh, were both influenced and influen by and influential in the political continuation of Ireland's ancient bardic tradition, as Mary Helen Twente has shown. The Lion of Old England and the Trial of Hurdy-Gurdy were considered among the ablest satires written in the Northern Star and were later published as pamphlets. The acid pen which wrote these two pamphlets prompted Martha McTeer to remark that Samson was excellent at the wit and ridicule that should be the order of the day in Belfast. Samson published also his trial of hurdy-gurdy, an entertaining and stinging political satire which also advocated republican and democratic principles, but whose specific attack was against the central role of the courts in the repression of popular dissent. The unfortunate hurdy-gurdy, a barrel organ, was convicted for having played a seditious tune by the name of Sa'ira. Samson's mock report of the trial depicted a biased judicial system which was the tool of a corrupt administration. Hurdy-gurdy, the defendant, stood for the rights of an oppressed people in the face of government determined to silence the popular dissent. The idea, surprisingly, was drawn from real events. Events had soon moved beyond mere differences of political opinion. The seeds of rebellion had already been sown. On April the 28th of 1794, the Reverend William Jackson, an Anglican clergyman who for several years had lived in France, was arrested while on a mission from the foreign office of his adopted country. On his trial for high treason a year later, the government presented evidence of a United Irish conspiracy to revolt with French aid. Samson appeared as assistant counsel with Curran and also reported Jackson's trial, which was the only Irish law report he published openly under his own name. The jury convicted. During his sentencing in a crowded courtroom, Jackson collapsed and died in the dock. He had taken, or as some suspect, had been administered poison in his cell. The following year, so successful was Samson's cause lawyering that the notorious General Lake informed Chief Secretary Pelham in London that the delay in the arrival of a prison ship to Carrick Fergus distresses us much and will, I fear, put us in the power of Councillor Sampson, who has declared his intention of prosecuting General Nugent and myself. During the spring assizes, the United Irish Legal Defence Team performed so well that, in the words of the manager of Lord Downshire's extensive estates, the prevarication of the evidence, the rascality of the jury, and the insulting declamation of Messrs. Curran and Samson rendered every exertion abortive at Armagh, the same sequel to the shadow of an assize as expected this week at Carrick, and I apprehend ours will not be very different to either. One of the magistrates complained that judges juries would not do their duty, even after they had been charged to convict. And it would soon follow that in a very short time, agents would publicly administer the United Oath under the confirmation that juries considered it legal. Samson's experience in the courts during this period drew him further into the fray. Although convinced even then of the truths propagated by the United Irishmen, Samson recalled that he was long in acting upon that conviction. He tried, if possible, to find some middle ground by which the most good could be effected and the most evil prevented. As this object became progressively more elusive, Samson found himself becoming part of the struggle. He came to know and identify with the sentiments of his clients, most of whom were charged with treason, sedition, and United Irish membership. I was connected with the accused at that time by no tie, he pointed out later, but the sympathies of humanity, and certainly not by interest, since all my hopes of advancement lay the other way. 
He was shocked to see hundreds of thousands of his countrymen branded as traitors and living at the mercy of a corrupt administration. I was a rebel only against the crimes of treason, disloyalty, subornation of perjury, murder, torture, kidnapping, arson, and housebreaking, crimes against which I was bound by my true allegiance to rebel. Ultimately, he had to choose. Manhood could not nor ought not to endure it. And seeing the crisis at hand when there could be no more neutrality, I took an open court in the trial of one of his clients for this offense, the oath of the United Irishmen, repeating it from the very document on which my client then stood upon his trial for his life or death. He did not do this from a spirit of bravado or romance, he said, but because I hated dissimulation and felt a consciousness that I was doing what became me, and I never have repented of it. The Northern Star newspaper had long been the object of government wrath. With the help of a defense team, including Samson and Kernan, it survived two separate pr prosecutions for seditious libel in 1794, for his advocacy, his anonymous reports of those trials, and his satirical writings. In that newspaper, Samson won a handsome silver urn, 18 inches high and beautifully inscribed, which I saw in the basement of the great-great-granddaughter of William Samson and Theobald Wolftone, Catherine Dickerson, who also held the private collection of letters which um, Marion mentioned. And this urn is a beautiful urn, uh, and it says, presented by the proprietors of the Northern Star to William Samson, barrister at law, in testimony of their approbation of his political principles and in gratitude for his disinterested ex exertions in favor of the freedom of the press. But Samson's endeavors for freedom of the press were not to cease. During this time, Samson also raised the ire of the government by authoring the strongly democratic Belfast resolutions. In January 1797, uh, in the interim, he had also published uh, another pamphlet called Advice to the Rich, warning that a rebellion might follow if reforms were not made. Clare, the Lord Chancellor, told the Irish House of Lords of the daring insolence displayed by the Belfast resolutions, which were of so treasonable a nature as to make us amazed at the mildness of government and not punishing the authors. And William Drennan, too, saw the danger. If I be the quietest man in, in Ireland, after his own conviction, um, Samson is certainly the most active that can leap upon a joint stool and harangue the populace at such a time, on such a topic, with such temper, and near such a body of military as were in the town. And I hear that had they waited another quarter of an hour, Colonel Barber would have broken up the meeting. Having refused to take up arms in support of the government, Samson, Emmett, and Curran would need all their hardihood of mind to resist what would come next when, according to Drennan, the nation would be obliged to choose between the dagger or the bowl. From his prison cell, Samuel Nielsen succeeded in making arrangements for the Northern Star's continuance, and William Sampson remained one of the newspaper's principal contributors. A few months later, the castle instructed Colonel Barber, in charge of the military, to make a further raid, to seize types, machines, papers, and everything else, and to arrest all concerned with the paper. On February the 3rd, 1797, the brothers Sims, who were then in charge, were duly arrested and transported from Belfast to a Dublin jail. Despite the fact that its proprietors were in jail, its types confiscated, and the castle had refused to permit the registration of its new printer, the Northern Star reappeared a few weeks later. Its resurrection was brief. On May the 19th of 1797, while Samson's petition was circulating, and only a few days before the prohibited meeting in Down, a party of the Monaghan militia attacked the Northern Star offices without a warrant, gutting it and destroying its contents. With extreme satisfaction, General Lake reported that the soldiers did lay about them most lustily, and almost totally demolished the whole of the machines. This time, the Northern Star did not reappear. Some months later, William Samson defended William Orr upon a charge of high treason. After an extremely suspect trial, Orr was sentenced to death for having administered the secret oath of the United Irishmen in 1796 to a government informer. The execution after a rigged trial of Orr left a signal impression upon Samson. More than 30 years later, looking back on a long and eventful career in an address to a group of fellow exiles, Assembled to honor him, Samson asked only that they remember his name along with that of Orr. This execution in October 1797 and the publicity that surrounded it sparked off a huge and threatening controversy. Orr was a popular martyr, and his last words, remember Orr, became a powerful rallying cry. 
or a sorry fate soon led to the imprisonment of Peter Finnerty, one of the United Irish printers. Finnerty put out the press, a Dublin radical newspaper which had taken over as the unofficial organ of the United Irishmen after the suppression of the Northern Star, which was considered one of the world's leading democratic newspapers of its day. Samson was a frequent anonymous contributor to the press as well as the Star. He acknowledged that many things indeed I did write for it, the whole of which I should have little hesitation to avow. At the time the press first appeared, he explained, being exposed by his residence in the country and the duties of his profession and of humanity to hear the grievances and injuries of the oppressed, Samson was confronted with shocking crimes against the people. In defiance of his private interest and at the risk of his personal safety, he felt compelled to have courage to express his honest indignation and at any ha hazard to vindicate the laws of God and man against them. Speaking for the furious Democrats on the trial of the Democratic printer, Peter Finnerty, Samson declared in court that the press was engaged in nothing more than repelling argument by argument, assertion by assertion, invective by invective, and that at a time when they have 100,000 armed men on the opposite side of the question and the press nothing for its defense but paper shot. Curran reminded the jury of recent events showing that the liberty of the press and the liberty of the people sink and rise together, and the liberty of speaking and the liberty of acting have shared exactly the same fate. Also in late 1797, Samson formed a society for obtaining authentic information of outrages committed on the people whose aim was to document irrefutably by sworn evidence the licentiousness of the military. He's showing a panoply of cause lawyering techniques which are extraordinarily far-sighted. He succeeded in bringing together a broad coalition ranging from Whiggish reformers such as Henry Grattan and George Ponsonby to ardent radicals such as Lord Edward Fitzgerald and Thomas Addis Emmet. Of this achievement, William Drennan from Belfast remarked that Samson is a compounder of parties here and thinks with some reason he is able to manage them all and what they are willing to do. Drennan gleefully described one occasion on which he saw Ponsonby and Curran, the parliamentarians, entering Samson's room at a time when Lord Edward Fitzgerald and the other militant United Irishmen were inside. Drennan relished the idea of Samson administering the revolutionary oath to the parliamentarians. I should not be surprised that he would put them up, and a ludicrous print it would make, Samson at a table with the book, and the contrasted visages of Ponsonby, Grattan, and Curran repeating the test of the United Irishmen, which one day they united with each other in the castle to ridicule, ridicule and reprobate. A great body of documents, ultimately over 300 sworn affidavits, was collected from all parts of Ireland, proving the atrocious system then carrying on. These papers contained details of most horrible outrages on the people, cruelty and foul deeds. The masses were driven to desperation and retaliation by murder, burning, destruction of property, often on suspicion of being suspected, and flogging. They were invoked by reformers in both the Irish and the English House of Lords, and according to one plausible account, were even transmitted personally to King George III, without result. Dublin Castle was infuriated at its continuing failure to silence the radical voice. Samson went to the press offices at 62 Abbey Street, just a few doors from his home, where he found the military smashing the presses and types with sledgehammers and arresting the apprentices. The government's immediate object, Samson learned afterwards, was to prevent the publication of a letter by the Cork barrister, John Shears, attacking Clare. Of Samson's attendance at the deathbed of both the Northern Star and the press, Richard Robert, Robert Madden, the United Irish historian, commented that he seems to have been destined to have walked, watched over the cradles and walked after the hearses of all the democratic journals of his time. For his endeavor, Samson's reward was to be put under arrest. As he left the press offices with the printer's sister-in-law, a pile of ball cartridges burst out of her apron and scattered all over the floor. The militia declined to believe the ammunition was on the premises only to guard against attack. Samson was released on bail, but he was a marked man, and his reprieve was short. For his radical lawyering and for his prolific, although generally anonymous, political writings on social and religious equality, Samson became a marked man, 
A warrant was issued for his arrest along with the United Irish leaders on March the 12th, shortly before the 1798 rebellion broke out with belated and inadequate French aid. Samson went underground but was eventually captured, imprisoned, disbarred and banished by act of attainder. Samson's name was among several for whom these warrants for treason were issued. On that fateful day, Emmett McNevin's sweet man and the two Jacksons were among 16 leading revolutionaries seized. When his lodgings were raided, Samson promptly took to his heels, as did Lord Edward Fitzgerald. Many of Samson's original papers documenting the military outrages were lost in his hurried departure. Some burned for fear of discovery. From his Dublin hiding place, Samson published open letters to the Lord Lieutenant and the Attorney General, offering to give himself up only if he was assured of a speedy trial or reasonable bail. He was prompted to do so by a sense of duty to a very great number of unfortunate prisoners who have entrusted the defense of their lives and liberties to me, and also because of his experience of hundreds imprisoned for months or years without trial or any means of vindicating themselves, however innocent they may be. While Samson went Underground, the country was proclaimed in a state of rebellion and martial law was declared. Samson kept very close confines, not attempting to go out of his lodgings, but at night time. You can imagine my, the thrill when I discovered the document of the person who harbored him uh, in the state paper office and I learned this backstory, which is not published anywhere else other than th that manuscript. So he went out only at night time when he did so in disguise. And eventually, another United Irishman engaged a berth for Samson on a collier bound for England secretly. Samson was immediately detained on suspicion upon landing at Whitehaven in April of 1798. He was traveling under an assumed name, Samuel Williams, and apart from claiming he was going to Edinburgh on undisclosed business, was, according to the magistrates who interrogated him, altogether, altogether shy about answering interrogatories. This account contradicts another story that Samson was traveling disguised as a woman, but was captured when somebody spotted him shaving. His servant Russell carried a brace of primed and load loaded pistols and had ball cartridges in his pocket. Surprisingly, and this truly is a unique uh, instance, an ambiguous one, in light of Samson's undeviating claims of distance from the armed uprising, and my sense is that he really was a prisoner of conscience and nothing else, but there is this odd note, at least according to the magistrate's account, a message to one Thomas Gill, Sir, some time ago I wrote to Mr. James Robinson of Liverpool to forge you an order for five gross of musket swivels to be sent. Portland and Pelham were informed of the capture. The English magistrates who examined this mysterious stranger astutely observed that he seemed much agitated, uh, much agitated at first, and by his allusions to the dangers of false imprisonments, we judged him to be of the legal profession. Although Samson and Russell denied any relationship, the next day, under intense questioning on his own, the servant unwittingly revealed the identity of his master. Having made no previous arrangements for lying, admitted Samson, we were very soon taken aback. Besides, Samson's daunting reputation as a fugitive rebel had preceded him. The magistrate's suspicions were particularly aroused when they learned that their captive's house had been visited by Lord Edward Fitzgerald. To confirm their suspicions, the magistrates sent a description of their captive to Dublin Castle. He seems about five feet, nine inches high, has dark brown hair tucked up under a very fair two-curled wig, has thick, dark eyebrows, a clear, good hazel eye, a good face, a strong and well-limbed, a thin beard, had on him a blue coat, red striped waistcoat, blue pantaloons and half boots, is evidently a gentleman and of good education. Some years later, in another passport issued to him, the French would add that Samson's features included a high forehead, a large nose, a middle-sized mouth, a round chin and an oval face. While Samson was being imprisoned without trial, the rebellion of 1798 broke out with the estimated loss of 30,000 lives. Alarmed at the prospect that the Irish state prisoners might be banished to the United States, Rufus King, the uh, American foreign minister in London, warned Timothy Pick Pickering, the American secretary of state, that their principles and habits would be pernicious to the order and industry of our people. And I cannot persuade myself that the malcontents of any character or country will ever become useful citizens of ours. And King, although he succeeded in 
persuading the Adams administration not to allow the Americans and the, the United Irish come to America at that time. He presently, presently added that nowhere would the United Irish leaders be more mischievous than in the United States, where from the sameness of language and the similarity of laws and institutions, they have greater opportunities of propagating their principles than in any other country. King convinced the Adams administration to exclude the state prisoners from the United States. As one Irish government official dryly explained to the captives, Mr. King does not like to have Republicans in America. It was decided instead to banish Samson to Portugal, a rare European country that was not there at, uh, then at war with England. A couple of days after Wolfe Tone's tragic death in his cell, the lovely Mary was ordered to sea against the will of its captain. Samson saw Ireland for the last time falling back into the heavy gales behind him. After a three-day battering by winds and waves, the lovely Mary was shipwrecked, a common trope in Samson's adventurous life on the Welsh coast on November of 1798. And that very same day, Samson's name was struck off the list of barristers on account of his having been of a seditious and traitorous society of men styling themselves United Irishmen and having confessed themselves guilty of high treason. You see here, this is the rolls in the King's Inns in Dublin where, uh, of course, the barristers are now trained. Um, uh, they keep this beautiful leather-bound book and that is the rolls, holding the names of, of all of the barristers and he was struck off, this is the line through, through his name here. And it says, erased by order of the 27th of November, 1798. And uh, on the same order, uh, the same line, uh, I also found, of course, uh, Emmett, who was imprisoned, disbarred, the same arrest warrant, the same banishment act, and also the same disbarment from the Irish legal profession. Samson read of the event in the newspapers in the midst of many false reports about him, but felt it not worth arguing about. In a series of letters to Cornwallis and Portland, however, he vehemently challenged the assertion that he had confessed treason. He always said that the crimes were committed not by him, but by the government. Upon his arrival in Portugal, Samson and his long-suffering servant, John Russell, were mysteriously imprisoned once more in Lisbon. Always the romantic Samson amused himself by attempting to communicate with a young lady across the street in another cell, sending messages first with a homemade bow and arrows and later in a hollowed orange rind tied to a thread. Among the other prisoners were a French bigamist, a Corsican smuggler, and a Portuguese diplomat. Suddenly in early May of 1799, Samson and Russell were put on board a Danish dogger, misleadingly dubbed de Hoffnung, and board for Bordeaux. They eventually reached France in June 1799. In the French Republic, Fran Samson was greeted with a hero's welcome. The, municipal mun the municipality of Bayonne resolved to protect him as a victim of despotism, whose sentiments of liberty and the zeal with which he had asserted it in the midst of atrocious persecutions were the cause of his sufferings. It was also suggested by the French that Samson, so well known in the annals of Ireland, may be able to offer very useful instruction touching the situation of the enemies of France. Alas, said William Samson, the advocates of the poor are few and their reward is ruin. But Samson fared better than his dissident friends who were hanged. He described Ireland as my ill-fated country where atrocity leads to honor and virtue to the scaffold. After their rendezvous in Paris, where Samson's name was proposed as a United Irish ambassador to the French government, he and some other exiled comrades made their way to New York City. Upon landing on American shores, these United Irish exiles both figuratively and literally left behind the colonial world and entered the post-colonial world of Jeffersonian New York City. In early 1806, New York City's Irish Catholics, as we have learned, demanded of the State Assembly in Albany that they be put on the same formal footing of religious freedom and, and political equality. They uh, requested the benefits of the free and equal participation of all the rights and privileges of citizens that were guaranteed to them by the state and federal constitutions and complained that it was frustrating to have the cup of equalized rights dashed from their lips by the test oath which was still in place. 
Mayor DeWitt Clinton, um, as we have learned, introduced a bill to, to abolish the test oath in New York State, and despite vigorous Federalist opposition, this Emancipation Bill comfortably passed so that Catholics were allowed to sit in the State Assembly a full generation before Daniel O'Connell's agitation achieved the same result across the Atlantic Ocean. The Jeffersonian American citizen applauded the outcome, saying that religion is most prosperous when it is most free. For Samson, after a voyage of seven weeks, he landed in the New World on July the 4th of 1806. He immediately addressed an open letter to Lord Spencer, the Lord of the Admiralty in, in London, um, and later published it in his memoirs in which he declared himself grateful to the British government for past favors. He described the Americans celebrating their liberty by singing Republican songs and drinking revolutionary toasts. I was in expectation that the Lord Mayor would have brought the military and fired on them declared Samson in mock surprise, but the mayor is not a lord, and I, I was informed that he was seen drinking with some of the soldiers. The Americans were making an outcry about a sailor killed off by an English captain. It is a pity we had not them in Ireland. We might have 10,000 of them shot in a day and not a word said about them, Samson said to Lord Spencer. He also claimed to be frustrated in going to the barracks to inform against the demonstrators because there was no barrack. The soldiers live in their own houses and sleep with their own wives. William Sampson learned that his disbarred friend, Thomas Addis Emmett, had re regained admission to practice without waiting for his United States citizenship. Sampson, too, was lucky. While staying at Ballstown, the springs in upstate New York, the Supreme Court of Judicature of the state of New York held a sitting in nearby Albany. Despite gloomy predictions from his friend, Samson impressed a notable bench enough to win back his license. But these warnings were not misplaced. Immediately after approving Samson's application, the court ordered that in future, only United States citizens would be admitted to practice law in New York State, a rule which stayed in place until the 1970s, when it was overthrown by the US Supreme Court, incidentally. As Samson put it, the court, after admitting me, made a rule to admit no other strangers under similar circumstances. The door, however, was not shut until I had contrived to walk in. Nevertheless, as he jubilantly declared after eight years in exile, I have now a profession at my back once more. With this narrow entry into practice, the banished United Irishman would emerge as perhaps the first career human rights lawyer known to history and as perhaps its first radical post-colonial legal theorist. A year after his arrival, Samson published his memoirs recounting his adventures from 1798 to 1806. They appeared at the end of a turbulent year that saw Emmett successfully rail against federalist, federalist royalist principles in the spring elections. Um, popular outrage against British impressment of sailors into its navy and the, impress, the imposition of the embargo. The prevalent anti-English feeling generated by these events undoubtedly contributed to the great success of Samson's memoirs, which Samson wrote as a denunciation of British policy in Ireland. This letter is one uh, addressed to his wife. It's today dated in July 1806. It's from the collection of letters which I mentioned in the possession of the descendants common to him and Wolfstone. Uh, these eight years he was separated from his wife are, for me as a historian, a wonderful trove because these letters to his wife are very different from his other correspondence with figures such as Thomas Jefferson. These contain very detailed and personal uh, accounts of his daily life. I'll just give you this as an example. And of course, you know, the search for these materials and even deciphering the handwriting. If you choose a project like this, try and find somebody who has good handwriting. It helps a lot. <laughs> Uh, another picture of Samson, and then these are the memoirs I just mentioned, and the title says it all, Memoirs of William Samson, including particulars of his adventures in various parts of Europe, his confinement to the dungeons of the Inquisition and Lisbon, etc., etc., several original letters in his correspondence with the ministers of state in Great Britain and Portugal, a short sketch of the history of Ireland, particularly as it respects the spirit of British domination in that country, and a few observations on the state of manners in the Central America. <laughs> this is uh, the second edition. Um, it went through uh, uh, at least it went through three editions, 
And um, lately it has been noted that it is actually occupies, uh, Samson has emerged as a, a very significant literary figure, particularly when you put these various anonymous works together and this is being noted more and more. And recently uh, a writer, on a, a, a literary critic uh, in Ireland has put this volume, uh, it's, he's given it pride of place in what he calls the Irish Gothic tradition, which of course includes Sheridan Le Fanu and and Bram Stoker and others. They, it has, these, these memoirs are an amazing read. They have this Kafkaesque sense of doom, but it's laced through with this, uh, this sarcasm and wit, which makes it uh, a very, very readable, um, wonderful literature. Samson immediately, um, he, he described the, this book to, 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 to Grace. He said, it is very sharp. You see, they did not listen to me when I was moderate. He immediately sent a copy of this work, along with a letter from Archibald Hamilton Rowan to Thomas Jefferson. Only a few weeks later, Jefferson responded by describing the work as adding a monument the more of what a country loses when it loses its self-government. Perhaps Samson's greatest success during these early years was a speech on the trial of James Cheatham for libeling Madame Bonneville, the lover of Thomas Thomas Paine in a scurrilous biography. Paine's recent death offered tempting bait for the scurrilous biographer. Paine's early writer, writings, including Common Sense and the Rights of Man, had done much to establish the intellectual underpinnings of the American French revolutions, but in his last great work, The Age of Reason, Paine underestimated the powerful hold that institutional religion maintained on American citizens. His memory was defended by Madame Bonville's advocate, William Sampson, in the courtroom, and also by Thomas Addis Emmett, who served as Tom Paine's uh, executor. After the triumph of his advocacy for Madame Bonneville, Samson was told that between newspapers and pamphlets, 25,000 copies of this speech were printed in several eastern cities. The extraordinary quantity and diversity of Samson's writings can be seen from the rapid succession of publications which flowed from his pen during his first five years in the United States. As you've seen, in 1806, the year of immigration, um, Bernard Dornan, another exiled United Irish rebel and printer, um, republished the trial of Hurdy Gurdy and followed it with another edition in 1807. Um, soon afterwards, there were other trials, the trials of Archilarius against Coleman for a libel, uh, the trial of Maturin Livingston against James Cheatham, Cheatham also for a libel, his memoirs. Um, he published uh, other trials, the trial of Dr. Little, um, the trial of the commissioners of the Ams House against Alexander Whistelow for the maintenance of a bastard child. Um, uh, also his report of the trial of Amos Broad and his wife for beating their slave Betty and her three-year-old child, Sarah. Um, another report of the trial of Lieutenant Renshaw for challenging Joseph Strong to a duel. In 1810, uh, his edition of William Cooper's Guide in the Wilderness, a handbook for poor Irish settlers in the interior of the United States, together with his own introduction. In October of that year, of 1810, Samson published his report of the trial of the journeyman cordwainers of the city of New York for a conspiracy to raise their wages by striking. And there are others also, too many to mention. Uh, quickly here. He published many of these works for maybe 50 or $100 or even for barter for books. I work from morning to night until night, he said. On one occasion he said that it had become common to publish his speeches when they are upon any pleasant occasion and witty. I wish I had an opportunity of sending you some of them. They would amuse you. It was in the trial of the journeyman Cordwainers that he boldly announced his call for a post-colonial jurisprudence and a national code. He argued vigorously that the English common law, in a way that, of course, he, he would uh, repeat in the Phillips case, giving rise to this prosecution, should be disregarded because it was based on a social order that was morally and politically unacceptable in a democratic republic. The English code and constitution are built upon the inequality of condition in the inhabitants. Samson reminded the American court, here all are in one degree, that of citizens and equal in their rights. Here, no man is subject, and no man lord or master. To allow that prosecution to proceed would give employers a legal method to ensure that the most useful class of workers grow poor as its oppressors grow rich. 
in 1810. He was uh, joined by his wife and his two surviving children. Um, after a four-year gap, there had been a previous four-year separation following 1798. Um, during the spring of 1812, President Madison's reimposition of the embargo sent a clear signal that war was in the offing unless Britain abandoned its long-standing policies of seizing American ships and impressing its seamen. Samson joined in the clamor. He published a biting satire that demolished the British government's insistence upon the legality of its impressment policy. His contribution, again, like hurdy-gurdy um, and uh, others, cast as a fake trial, but unalloyed political propaganda under, underneath was the trial of Captain Henry Whitby for the murder of John Pierce with his dying declaration and also the trial of Captain George Crimp um, for piracy and man-stealing. Although not so clear today, the significance of the title was very plain to Samson's public. Crimp was the verb in common currency to describe the infamous work of the press gangs. In the vein of the trial of Hurdy-Gurdy, this satire reports two mock trials in which British officers are arraigned for the impressment of American seamen, and it contrasts the freedom and benevolence of an idealized United States against the tyranny and oppression inflicted by a rapacious Britain. And his next great case, of course, you know as much about probably as most people, because that's People versus Phillips in 1813. There, um, as you know, I think, um, Samson interjected when uh, Father Coleman made his um, statement to the court in which he said that he would have to prefer death or any other um, temporal misfortune rather than reveal the secrets of the confessional. Samson jumped up, introduced himself as an amicus curiae, and I think there really is no other instance of a group amicus curiae, test case, cause lawyering, that comes so early as this. It really is something very like Brown versus Board of Education, which of course is so much later. So it's an extraordinary role which he takes in, 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 in this case. We don't have all of the details of it. He wasn't writing to his wife at that time, uh, because of course they were together. And um, the, the scene with the trustees, while it's in, in many ways suggested from the, um, from the letter that the trustees wrote, um, saying that they wanted to go forward with the trial, um, much of that was a reconstruction rather than being based on the details which we have in the report of the trial itself. Despite his rhetorical victory uh, in Phillips, William Sampson's work was not done. As uh, Michael James Callahan has pointed out, uh, while Samson's influence and his place in American legal history are lasting because of his, his association with the codifiers, he also possessed a more arcane talent which helped ensure the spread of his legal outlook. And this is a reference to Samson's command of shorthand, which he had, again, deliberately uh, mastered this skill in Ireland for political reasons. And so this was his practice of using the courtroom as a, his own soapbox and then publishing accurate reports of the trials that he transformed and engineered into high politics. He had begun this practice in Ireland where he sought to expose the politically corrupt and indefensible nature of the imposed English common law. Samson developed his skill as a stenographer to combat the government's control over legal ideology. And his publication of the, um, of the Catholic question uh, is very much in this tradition. Um, and over time, it was cited several times in courts before the Civil War, and it was also codified in 1828 at a time when uh, Samson was leading a movement to codify American law. The priest penitent privilege was captured in this, reduced to a code in New York, uh, later also put into a code form in California during the gold rush, uh, from which place, it ricocheted back eastwards, if you like, as the American expansion westward continued and the California codes were copied in many, many states. So that it was eventually, um, in the 1960s, there was only six states which did not have the priest penitent privilege, three in New England, in the Northeast, and three in the South. But today, all 50 states um, have adopted the privilege um, 
which Samson originally established based on the constitutional argument. Samson expressed his pride in making this report public. In his introduction, he said, the general satisfaction given to every religious denomination, he said, is well calculated to dissipate antiquated prejudices and religious jealousies. He extolled the Phillips decision as representing an emerging post-colonial jurisprudence in Republican America. He said, when this adjudication shall be compared with the baneful statutes and judgments in Europe upon similar subjects, in his introduction, the superior equity and wisdom of American jurisprudence and civil probity will be felt. And he rightly predicted, as we know today, that his report of Phillips would constitute a document of history precious and instructive to the present and future generations. And the following year, it was published in uh, Dublin, and you'll reach a certain point in the, his transcription of the arguments where there's an insertion saying that the following material needed to be omitted because of the seditious libel laws still in place in that country. One of Samson's close friends and correspondents in Paris was David Bailey Warden, another banished United Irish Protestant in the exile of 1798, who served an important role as an informal cultural ambassador. In 1819, several years after its publication in New York, Warden sent Samson the Parisian journal Chronique Religieuse's recent review of the Catholic question in America. The reviewer is none other than Bishop Henry Gregoire, the fearless and uncompromising Catholic cleric and Republican who had personal reasons for welcoming Samson's eloquent defense of religious toleration, having successfully defied the various brands of despotism exerted in turn by Robespierre, Napoleon, Louis XIII, and the Quadruple Alliance. In his fulsome praise for Samson's argument in Phillips, the venerable Gregoire mistook the religion of its impassioned advocate. After reading the bishop's review in the Chronique Religieuse, the Protestant Samson wryly told Warden that if I was not past the days of vanity and ambition, I should be greatly elated to see that I was so main a pillar of the faith. We were all much amused by it, though if there came some profit by it, it would be more amusing still. In fact, the praise of Bishop Gregoire, a true Republican and Democrat, meant a great deal to the banished Irish advocate. And almost a decade later, in a letter to his friend Julian Verblanc on the eve of Catholic emancipation in the British Parliament, Samson was still smiling at the thought that his support for auricular confession had gone so near to canonize me and procured me the benediction of the great Bishop Gregoire. In the years following um, the Phillips case, Samson remained active and in some ways increased his influence um, to really make his mark upon uh, jurisprudence and also upon literature. Um, among other things, he also uh, lobbied for domestic manufacturers, uh, went to Washington where he was hosted by President Monroe to do that. He published an extraordinary report of Is a Whale of Fish, which was uh, which was written about in a beautiful book from Princeton uh, just about a year ago. In, in 1820, Samson's only surviving son, who had just started up a newspaper uh, in New Orleans, died of yellow fever in his 20s, um, which was tragic, um, leaving him only his, his daughter, uh, Catherine. Um, uh, Samson, in the years that followed that, uh, as I have mentioned, he led his attack on the English common law with his famous 1823 Discourse on the Common Law, which he uh, published in the same year that w w William Fenimore, um, uh, as James Fenimore Cooper, published the first American novel. So this was the nationalization of literature and law, a common enterprise of separating from, 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 from England. Uh, we have also mentioned that Samson also argued um, the Greenwich Village Orange Day trials. Um, and uh, in those, uh, the judge was um, Richard Riker, none other than Richard Riker, now the recorder of New York, who um, served as a judge in this case and uh, who in many ways incorporated much of Samson's um, ideals in his um, in his, uh, in, in his judgment, and also in other uh, speeches which he gave at that time. Samson moved to, to Washington, D.C. in 1826, um, 
and lived there with uh, Matilda Tone and uh, her son and, of course, Samson's daughter. They were married and the grandchild. It was during that time that um, Samson, that Tone published in two volumes the diaries of Theobald Wolf Tone, which became the iconic um, foundation in many ways of uh, Irish republicanism. They're written with the kind of verve which Samson also had, and they became uh, something of a Bible for Irish nationalists, if you like. Uh, it was probably the single most influential work of Irish American nationalist republican historiography. And uh, the fact that it was produced uh, with the two, uh, the three generations of Samson's and Tones living under the one roof, uh, I think is significant. And, sh and I think we can see Samson's hand in some sense uh, there too. So, yeah, I'm just finishing up. So, a couple of final um, observations of him um, from uh, those who knew him. Uh, in his final years, he um, made an effort to go back to Ireland, um, but this uh, was at, conditions were attached to it which uh, he would not accept, and. Uh, uh, one of his correspondents, the son of a, another executed Irish rebel, a Senator Porter in this country, said, I can readily account for your anxiety to have the Bill of Attainder and Banishment, which excludes you from Ireland, repealed. He wrote, perhaps if I were in your situation, I would share it. It's quite possible that I should, but I confess that with my present feelings, I think you ought not to desire it. Let it remain and do not seek to expunge it. Your posterity will one day be proud to point to it as proof of the virtue of their ancestry. There's nothing of which I am so jealous as the fact that I am the son of a man who died a martyr to the wrongs of his native land. In his last surviving letter, Samson told his daughter Catherine that his disease seemed to be developing in a new form and verging to a crisis. Uh, he suffered from dropsy in his final year in 1836. I'm willing to hope the best and on the other hand quite reconciled and ready for whatever may come. I think you have nothing to apprehend for me that need trouble your mind. And I pray you to enjoy all the pleasures that good company, rural scenery, flowers, blossoms, and fruits, music, and song can afford. Uh, Grace mentioned to Samson's daughter that Dr. McNevin had just been there tending to his friend, Samson, and she called in that letter Samson by the nickname Lion, which he had earned in 1794 for one of his satires. After this long illness, Samson died of dropsy at the end of 1836. A dissident Irish Protestant tended in his last days by his old United Irish friend and comrade, the Catholic doctor William James McNevin. In death, Samson and McNevin were eventually laid side by side overlooking picturesque Bowery Bay in the plot of the Riker family, where they had found refuge in the relative freedom and equality of antebellum America. A tomb of white marble was erected over Samson's remains, which have since been moved to Greenwood Cemetery. It bears the following inscription. Beneath this stone lie the mortal remains of William Samson, born in Londonderry, Ireland, January 27, 1764, died in New York, December 28, 1836, and United Irishmen, he defended the cause of civil and religious liberty. His countrymen requited his services by their love. His enemies attested his wisdom and atoned for their persecution by adopting his measures. The cheerful temper and invincible mind that supported him in the dungeons of the Inquisition sustained him during his long exile and through his last most painful illness and shed an affecting serenity around his departing spirit. He was res resigned to the will and trusted in the mercy of his God. This stone is erected and inscribed to his memory by an affectionate wife and only daughter. Thank you. I, I, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm certainly happy to take one or two if, if anyone would like, would like to. Brian McCaffrey. Uh, yes, did Samson ever seek to be restored to the bar in Ireland? I know he's admitted in New York, but 
uh, did they ever restore him in Ireland? Did, was Samson restored to the bar in Ireland, or did he ever seek to be restored? You know, he, he, he was not. Um, he never was, uh, although in 1798, on the bicentennial of the rebellion, um, uh, uh, two plaques were put up in the round hall of the four courts. So that's actually the area which all of the Supreme Court judges would walk through, and you will see them there on either side. The documents I showed you earlier are quite interesting because there is a technical inaccuracy in them. Uh, they are all required, the various lawyers are required to show cause why they should not be disbarred. Uh, Samson's name is not repeated in two places where it should be. So an enterprising lawyer might actually argue in Samson's case that there's a technical defect in it. But no, he hasn't been uh, restored. It would be, I think, uh, a good thing to do, but Senator Porter's sentiment might be another way of thinking about it. What was the function of a court reporter in those days? Uh, and, and I'm just wondering if part of the flower of his, the chemistry of his writing, et cetera, might have uh, in part come from hearing all of these people and being in a relatively unique position, not only hearing them, but actually rewriting them or, or recording them, uh, whatever the function of a you court know, reporter it, it, ver was. it very much is. I mean, Samson is interesting not only as an extraordinary individual in his own right, but, but because his life through these trials we know much of early American labor history comes from his report on the Cordwainers trial, for example. So these cases become places where people who were not even necessarily literate, you know, um, there, he has the verbatim words as if a tape recorder was on and he, his cases and his work give glimpses, much more than glimpses, into whole areas of social life that would otherwise be unknown, uh, unknown to us. The role of the court reporter, today students, law students read just appellate opinions from judges that's looking through the wrong end of the telescope. When you read it this way, you see how these cases were made. Um, he was a private law reporter. Official law reports weren't introduced uh, generally until even the 1820s, when courts began to pay to have the the reports officially recorded. He was part of an earlier generation, and in his case, it was not simply to make a profit, but it was actually to show the failure of the Irish system. So he was a very pioneering figure, and one pamphlet written about him was actually published by the American Stenographers Association, because they were so intrigued at his own unique form of shorthand notation, which he developed to do this. Maybe one more? I'm not aware that he has, um, uh, but that could be simply because I haven't gone there to look. Um, I think his name may be known. Uh, there's a particular parish there, which of course was his, you know, his family parish, the Anglican parish there. Um, so, uh, so the, you know, the roots of the family were certainly there, but I, I'm not aware of anybody making the connection in recent years. No. Uh, so. Yeah, I have a question, Walter. Oh, okay. Um, you, you spoke about his experiences with the Irish peasantry as, as a possible influence on him. Uh, do we know anything else about other influences where his ideas got, you know, what was the source of his ideas? Was, was his father a specific influence, particularly with respect to social, uh, political power arrangements? We, we really don't. His, his brother George um, was somewhat of a moderate reformer, you know, certainly not antagonistic towards Catholics, but, but not anywhere radical in the way that Samson certainly became if he didn't begin that way. In terms of what the other influences would be, it's actually very difficult to trace those. I mean, it is amazing to read these cases in which he shows this incredible command of everything from classical antiquity and, and language. He can move from Latin to Greek. Um, he's uh, knowledgeable about current theories of science and a case involving the race of the bastard child I mentioned, for example, or as well a fish. It's really the current, you know, leading edge of science. He can master all of this. At the same time, he never went to university. It was sometimes said that he went to Trinity, but that's not an accurate statement. Um, so apart from his education in uh, London around the time when The Rights of Man was being published, it, it really was just a milieu in which 
uh, there was a shared appreciation of learning and knowledge, and also not the compartmentalization into separate disciplines that we have today. So uh, the recent book from Princeton on Is a Whale a Fish, one of the reviewers of that noted that uh, the oratory, it's something that is unimaginable today. And I think that that's a true statement. It's a classical learning is what we would call it, perhaps. So thank you very much. This has been a, a well, pleasure. Uh, thank you, Walter.